On today's show, it's all about sturgeon. So, ready to make a difference? Building a better planet starts with you. home and welcome to another great episode of Aqua Kids. I'm Katie and I'm Drew. Today we're headed out on the Penobscot River where we will be learning all about sturgeon. There is some great research taking place to assess the sturgeon populations and find out what can be done to prevent them from extinction. That's right Katie. I don't know too much about it so let's go meet up with Matt, one of the researchers, to learn some more. Okay let's go. We're here on the Penobscot River with Matt. So Matt, Tell us what we're doing here today. Yep, absolutely. Today we are fishing gill netting specifically for short nose and Atlantic sturgeon mm -hmm. on the Penobscot River. Um, this project started back in 2006 uh, as essentially a status assessment uh, of the short nose and Atlantic sturgeon populations in the Penobscot River. Uh, prior to 2006, we uh, didn't even know if sturgeon were living in the Penobscot. Oh, wow. So, um, you know, relatively recent study. Uh, today we're trying to capture fish so that we can continue this status assessment. Uh, we do a lot of tagging work uh, to try and identify individual fish and uh, we also do quite a bit of acoustic telemetry uh, following the fish around throughout the different systems, uh, figuring out what they're doing and uh, kind of where they're going, why they're here. What is the goal of your project? So the overall goal of the project, again, is to uh, assess the status of both species in actually the Gulf of Maine region. Uh, our focus is the Penobscot River, but we're interested in population functionality essentially uh, within the entire Gulf of Maine system for both species. Uh, they are both endangered, they federally are, okay. listed as endangered yeah. species, uh, and so the more we know about you know, both species, the uh, better we can inform managers and, and conservationists. So how do you go about doing this? Yep, so on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, we come out on the Penobscot and uh, use some of our acoustic telemetry equipment. This is actually um, called a Vemco VR100 receiver. And basically what it allows us to do is to detect the presence of sturgeon based on uh, some pinging signals that their tags give off. We surgically implant tags inside of the wow. fish that give off beeping signals, and we can use this to so this detect this is a hydrophone, you exactly. in the water and you pick out the signals? Exactly, so this, put it in the water, listen for the beeps, and then we can figure out exactly where the fish are. And so what we have here is uh, another hydrophone, but it's a directional hydro hydrophone. Uh, unlike the other one, this one you can turn 360 directions, yeah, degrees, and figure out exactly where the signal is coming from. And so what we can do is turn the unit on, turn the volume up, just have some background noise, and we can actually take this and stick it in the water. After we turn the fish finder off. Oh. Is that the one right now, the beeping? Yep, and that actually is a sturgeon. Is that one that you've see caught if we can pick before? It up again. And with these hydrophones, uh, a lot of times when the river is moving, you have a lot of debris in the water. It picks up a lot of uh, background noise. Okay. But when we do hear a sturgeon, it'll be very uh, obvious. Oh, yep. There's one. Oh, there they are. How deep is it here? It's about 30 feet deep. So they're all the way at the bottom because they're bottom feeders, right? Yep. So you, wow. yep. They're sitting right on the bottom. So what we're hearing are fish that have already been tagged. Uh, and each fish has its own number, so we know which frequency and which yep, fish are it, in the it, area. Each tag has an associated uh, individual ID. So that helps us link this information back to the actual handling and capture of the fish. True, that hydrophone technology was just amazing. That's for sure, Katie. 
I was very impressed how the hydrophone could pick up signals from the fish so that the researchers could actually tell where the sturgeon were swimming. It seems like a very useful tool. Instead of going out and having to catch all the sturgeon in order to determine whether they've been caught before, the technology will allow the researchers to know where the fish are right from the get-go. Don't go too far. Aqua Kids will be back in a few. Aqua Kids presents another Aqua Kids pop quiz. It seems that people are fascinated with sharks and always want to know which one's the biggest, the fastest, or has the most teeth. But this record-setting shark is famous for being small. The dwarf lantern shark is the smallest known shark in the world. Can you guess how little these guys are? Is it A, less than 12 inches, B, less than 10 inches, or C, less than 9 inches? I'll be back with the long and short of this shark after the break. Did you guess how small the smallest shark in the world is? The answer is C, less than nine inches long. The dwarf lantern shark is a little known species of dogfish that at present is only known to live in the waters off Colombia and Venezuela. Welcome back to Aqua Kids. Let's get back on the boat in Maine to see what the next step in the process is. Let's go. So now that we know where the fish are, what comes next? Yep, so now that we found the fish, we have 200 yard long gill nets that wow. we will set. Um, and we will set them uh, parallel to the current since we are fishing in a river so they don't get knocked over by the current. Uh, and these nets sit on the bottom because sure. that's where the, the sturgeon are found. Uh, we'll fish them for about an hour. And uh, after that time, we'll go pull them in and remove any fish that, that we've caught. But in they're the net. heavy. <laughs> yep, yeah, they can be. Because sturgeon are an endangered species, are there regulations you have to follow? Yep, there are actually very strict regulations that we have to follow uh, in order to handle these fish. Uh, one specifically that we'll be following today is the amount of time that we can have nets in the water. Uh, that's based on the water temperature. Oh, okay. And so uh, with the water temperature around 70 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, we're looking at a netting time of about one hour. As soon as we get to the buoy, I'm going to pull in the buoy, and then there's a line attached to an anchor. Okay. Um, your job is just to keep all that out of our way until I get it in. Should I put it in the bucket? No, or uh, just put it in the back. Put right? it in the back. All right. um, and then we have to unclip the anchor, pull it in, and then we actually get to the net. If we catch a sturgeon, I'm going to bend down, grab it by its tail, uh, and then my hand's going to go under its stomach. You are going to try to grab the net in front of it mm -hmm. to relieve the tension from the fish. Got it. As we come up to this buoy, you guys, Mike's going to grab it. He's going to pull it into the boat, and then immediately following that, the net will be there, and we'll just feed it right into this bucket. So how many sturgeon do you usually catch a day? Uh, it depends on the day. Uh, sometimes, you know, we catch four or five. Right. We have other days in the fall, though, where we can catch as many as 60 in one net. Wow, that's a lot. Oh, oh, we got sturgeon. Oh, we got sturgeon. I think it's slow. Shot. Okay. Yeah, like right. Just grab that right here. Yeah. When I say so, we're gonna bring it right up into the boat. Ready? One, two, three. Um, good. Wow, he's a big fella. That's pretty good. Cool. Okay. Oh, we got another one over there. It's a little far away. Uh, we got we got two sturgeon real close to each other, man. Okay. Um, Oh, nice. What happens after they're in the net pen? Yep, so what we'll do after we get all the nets in, uh, the boat and all the fish out of the nets, we'll work the fish up in the boat, take measurements, tag them, uh, and then release them back into the river. That sounds good. Yep. 
Although we've heard a lot of negative things about gill nets, it seems that the researchers were being very responsible with the use of these nets. Absolutely. The researchers were very careful to make sure that the nets were only in the water for a limited period of time to meet all of the regulations. Not only that, but it seemed that you didn't catch anything but sturgeon. Bycatch can be very destructive, but the scientists definitely seem to have eliminated bycatch in their gill nets. Definitely. Welcome back. Now that Drew has done such a great job catching the fish, it's time to take some measurements. Let's get started. All right, it's time to work up the sturgeon. Yep, Let's here we go. go. Michael, hand us the first fish. Are we putting him here or in there? Yep, no, we're going to put him right here. We're right. going to measure him. Right, hold him down. He's a and what I'm going to have you do, I'm going to set the fish yep. on the floor. Mm -hmm. And then just make sure the tip of its nose is lined up right even Got to that, to the end of the tape measure. Oh, oh my sorry. God. What species is this? This is a short-nosed sturgeon. OK. All right. And, and, and that's probably because the snout is shorter than the other ones. Yeah, I mean, we'll, we can do a comparison in a okay. little bit so you can see the difference between an Atlantic and a short nose, but this is a pit tag reader. Um, if the fish has already been recaptured, it'll have a small glass tag inside of it, and this will help me pick it up if it has had one. So the next thing we do is take a picture. We photo document all of these fish. Okay, thanks. Actually, Drew, if I can have you back up just for a second, sure. please. So then I move photo ID up to the tank, pull the tape measure out, and then, uh, Drew, if you can fold that over and just hold it, just hold it right there, yep. And we're gonna get a weight on the fish now. So slide that over, slide that over. Hold it on yep. both sides. Oh, you need to come down a little bit, I can't see it. All right, go ahead and let it down. We're gonna need to adjust that. All right. And now we take the fish, set it into the tank. Okay, does this help with aeration so it's not out of the water too long? Yeah, exactly. We try not to keep them out of the water for very long. Yeah, so make sure they're not stressed. Right. The uh, first measurement we'll take is called interorbital, and that's just the distance between the, the eyes. eyes. Okay. Interorbital is 7.1.5. How many different measurements are you going to take today? Uh, we'll take about five or six. The interorbital in the mouth dimensions is another way uh, that you can use. You can use those to differentiate between Atlantic and short nose sturgeon. Oh, okay. okay. So this is their the underside of their uh, head. We get an outside mouth measurement, which is this to the ear. The okay. ear. Outside lips is six five point zero. And then we, yep, we do an inside mouth. Oh, look at that. Oh, they have a weird mouth. Why? Yep, well, I'll, I'll show you that in a second. The inside mouth measurement is uh, 47.6. Mike, can you take that, please? And then, yeah, so because so these specific are- specific to their biology. Yep, they're so bottom feeders. And so while they're swimming along the bottom, these barbels kind of trail along and help them detect food in the substrate. Once they find their food, and actually, these little chemosensory pores oh, yeah, all, the all around dots. here also help them do that. Once they find food, their mouth is kind of like a Whoa. vacuum. <laughs> and so you can see it comes out pretty far. Oh and that helps them suck stuff off the bottom. And the skin is very sandpapery. I'd yes, say. yep, very it is. rough. And there has all these what, scutes yep. on it. These are, it has five rows of scutes. It has two ventral, uh, two lateral on either side, and then one dorsal row. And what are they for? What do they do? Yep, the scoots uh, serve as a protection. Um, they're yep, exactly. They're they're more important when the fish are really little, and there are uh, there are more predators that could eat them. And uh, I'm sure we'll see this on some of the other fish we've caught today. But this fish, all its dorsal scoots have kind of been worn down over time. So this is probably a, an older fish. Okay. But How old are you they can. Dead? Uh, Short-nosed sturgeon can live for up to 60 years. Wow. Oh my goodness, that's a long time. Um, but the scoots on the younger fish, you'll see they have very sharp points. Okay. And like sharp enough to cut yourself. Really? And so those serve uh, yep, as a protection, as a type of protection. Now sturgeon have been around for a long time, haven't they? They're prehistoric. Yeah, they are. They are a prehistoric fish. Um, I mean, you could 
really think of them essentially as a, a living fossil. So they really haven't long. changed in biology or body shape in a long, no, long time. No, no, in a very, very long time. No. Is it a male or a female? How will we know? It's very difficult, if not impossible, <laughs> to, to tell the sex of uh, a short-nosed sturgeon externally. So you can't just look at it really okay. and say. So this gives us an internal means to do that. It's basically just a little light on the end of uh, this glass tube here. And we can look through it and what we do is you can stick it inside of the sturgeon very carefully. And I can look inside the fish. And if there are eggs present, I should be able to see them. And actually, this is a female. Okay, wow. so she has some eggs. Yep, she does have some eggs. They're very small right now um, and pretty undeveloped. When the eggs are mature, um, I don't know if you've ever seen caviar, they're dark, oh, yeah. they're about the size of a peppercorn. So, but her, the, the eggs that I saw in her today, very small, very white, so. Do you get more males or females in this river usually? Well, <laughs> the, the tough thing about uh, sexing sturgeon too is we can only, with this method, I can only tell if it's a female. Wow. So it's either okay. a fish of unknown sex or it's a female. I got you. Go ahead, Drew, flip the fish back okay. onto its uh, front side. Yep, there we go. The next step is to take genetics from each genetics. of these fish. And so we take just a small fin sample from the dorsal wow. fin. So if, Drew, if you can pick the fish up just, just out of the water, what we do is we take just a small clip of the fin put it in this little vial of alcohol, and then this information actually gets uh, sent off to be analyzed. Oh, really? Yep. And that's to help understand the population structure of these fish. So um, to be able to tell if fish from, say, the Penobscot, the Hudson, um, the Altamaha River in Georgia, if they're coming from different stocks. So they can match the DNA with other fish around the area? Yep. That's yep. Neat. To tell if they're the same population, essentially. It seemed like working up the fish really took a lot of effort. It sure was, but it was a fun thing to be a part of. Oh, for sure. The information that is collected is also so useful for the researchers to be able to study the sturgeon in great depths and figure out what needs to be done in order to prevent them from becoming extinct. That's right, Katie. our top story. Dolphins use names. It may seem like fiction, but recent studies show that bottlenose dolphins may actually use names for each other. While the labeling and naming of objects with learned sounds is a foundation of human language, it is actually quite rare in animal communication. Normally, an animal would respond to natural and instinctual sounds, but they would not be able to learn and understand new sounds. Scientists, however, have found that dolphins are different. Dolphins are able to create something called a signature whistle, a unique sound that identifies them. When another dolphin copies this signature whistle, they are in essence getting the dolphin's attention by calling their name. This makes bottlenose dolphins one of the only non-human mammals that are able to use labels in their natural communication system. I'm Katie with Aqua News, keeping you connected to our planet. Now back to Aqua Kids. Aqua Kids is back. Now that we've taken all of the measurements, it's time to pit tag and release them. All right, so the next step is to pit tag the sturgeon because it wasn't previously captured, didn't already have one. This is the pit tag right here. Wow, uh, it's a very, long. very small, um, just glass encapsulated tag. We put it in this syringe, and actually I can show you what it does. If there were to already have been a pit tag in the fish, we can read it with that and it'll give oh, you cool. an alphanumeric code. Oh, so you'll know exactly which fish you got. Exactly. Wow. Yeah, we'll know exactly what fish it was. So the pit tag is now in the syringe. We always pit tag our fish on the same side, which is the uh, right side of the fish. We'll take the needle, we stick it in just under the skin and twist it a little bit, put it in and inject the tag, pull out. So it really doesn't hurt them at all. No, no. Yeah, you didn't kick. And actually, we can we can double check that with our little uh, reader, and then yep. see. So that's the number right there. Yep, 
Exactly. That's the uh, individual ID for this fish, cool. hopefully for the rest of its life. Okay, the fish is ready to be released. Yep, absolutely. We are all done working it up. So, take it out. Yep, grab it. Move it. And we'll come to, to the, side. this side of the boat. Okay. And gently set it in the water. And I just hold on to the tail until it's ready to swim off on its own power. There it goes. Well, a lot's being done. Removing dams, decreasing interaction with the sturgeon, and it benefits all the species in the Penobscot River. So thank you for having us out today. This was really fun. Yeah, thank you guys for coming. Well, it looks like we've run out of time for today's episode. I had a great time watching you guys learn all about sturgeon. It was really neat to be able to take part in such instrumental research. You know, taking the measurements, the pictures, and inserting the pit tags are all very important so that the scientists can learn as much as they can about the species. Right, and once the scientists have this information, they are able to assess the status of the species and dictate what needs to be done in order to protect them and prevent their extinction. It really is some amazing work that the researchers are doing. It should inspire everyone to do their part to help keep this planet green and blue. And so can you. So visit our website for cool eco tips. And fun links to show you how we can keep the world. And the water. A great place to play and explore. And we'll see you next time on, on Aqua Kids. Kids.